Okay, wonderful. So we also have our annual conference, which is taking place in Toronto in June. Um, that's coming up quickly. Registration is open now, so please check out uxpa2017.org for more information about that. A couple quick housekeeping things um, for this webinar. Um, we will be using the, the right panel um, to, um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them right there in that panel, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, you can use the questions or the chat there in the, in the panel. We'll also have the recording available um, after the session. We will add closed captioning to the recording and then um, share that on our website. Um, be sure to check out the uxpa.org website for upcoming webinars. As I mentioned, we have these monthly and we have more lined up for the year. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Lisa. Um, Lisa Fast has been a UX researcher in um, service design and behavioral research for over 25 years. We're delighted to have her here speaking with us today. Over her um, UX career, she's been a programmer, a designer, a product manager, and a researcher. Um, so she's done quite a bit. Um, she's quite an expert in the field. She's also an active GitHub collaborator on the Government of Canada's Web Experience Toolkit. So she is with us today presenting Stretching Online Research Tools to Meet Your Research Goals. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm excited to be here um, from Canada, by the way, as well. So I'm looking forward to the UXPA conference in Tehran. So um, today I'm going to talk about all these different ways to use online research tools. And I have a few favorites that I'm going to pick out and uh, shout out, I guess. And one of them is Survey Gizmo. Um, and in particular, we like them because they now have a Canadian server and we can keep our data here uh, and follow Canadian privacy rules and laws, which are a little more strict <laughs> than other countries. Um, and I'm going to talk about some funky ways to use optimal workshop tools, in uh, particular Chalkmark and TreeJack. And I'm also going to talk about um, an online remote eyes decide uh, eye tracking tool that I worked with last summer and a uh, terrific team that uh, I was able to work with them during their beta. So it was uh, lots of fun. So I'm going to talk first about prototyping with surveyware. So using survey tools to, to prototype. And I just want to draw your attention down to your chat panel in your, uh, in your GoToMeeting uh, control panel. Um, because I want you to use the chat panel to just uh, have a look at this, this next question. I'd like to little, know a little about you. Um, so if you can just use your chat panel to let me know what you're seeing there. And okay. All right. Thank you. I'm not actually seeing any chats, but if Lisa, you type. Sorry, Lisa. So it looks like um, people are using the questions panel, which is it, ah, the questions good. panel. Okay, super. Thank you. Right. Okay. So here's some yeses and here's some noes. Thank you. That's terrific. Yes, yes, yes. And a few people are saying the word Reddit. They're typing in Reddit. And uh, the Reddit is up here, and these are the instructions. This is actually an attention filter. And if you didn't type in Reddit, um, you're like many, many, many people, and that is you didn't read the instructions because what drew your eye was the question, and what drew your attention was the question. Um, or you've been to one of my talks before. <laughs> um, and this is called a question filter, an attention filter. And um, Oppenheimer, Mavis, and David Enko uh, did a study. And what they found was that you are far more likely to skip the instructions and go to the question on a screen versus a paper test, right? So they're actually using this to test whether people um, are paying enough attention to the questions in their research. But I flip it around and say, look how much attention people pay to questions. And that's why I'm so interested in surveyware, and that's why I use it. And I have a whole other talk on all the ways and the design patterns around questions and all that kind of stuff. 
So let's talk about meeting some of these research goals with, with uh, SurveyWare. And one of them is measuring the success of replacing instructions with a question. So here's the existing page on a Government of Canada website, and it's about finding out if you need a visa, visa to come to Canada. So if you're coming to UXPA in Toronto, you might want to check out this page. Um, and you'll notice that there's a question and there is instructions above it. And what happens, and I could play a video, but it would just look like this, which is that the people's mice come down and they immediately open the question and they choose their, the answer in terms of the question, the country that they're using. Um, and then they get the answer to whether they need a visa or not. Uh, so what was happening is people are missing these things up here that are exceptions. You're not supposed to use the question if you fit into one of these exception categories. And that was a real problem for it. So, so we need to do some research to test out alternatives to this, to this model. And what we came up with was um, a way to prototype it in Survey Gizmo and test it, and then test it again, because questions are tricky and you need to test them. Um, so we prototyped it in Survey Gizmo by embedding a survey question, just a radio button question, into um, a Canada.ca page on GitHub. So you can just um, embed it. And so now people answer the question first, which catches their exceptions, and then it goes straight to the need a visa, visa question. And so we were testing this. So when I say now, I mean in the prototype that we were testing. Um, so. So this was a way to really quickly mock up what that question could look like. And if you're proficient at coding, that's great. You can whip up a, your own radio button question in HTML5, but we had a team here that needed to, to do this really quickly um, in some design sprints. So we built it in Survey Gizmo, and then there's a way to, under the Share tab in Survey Gizmo, or whatever kind of survey where you're using, there's a way to copy that script pop it into, so you just click, you just copy all this script, paste it into your prototype page, and you end up with a working survey uh, tool like that. Now, so you might wonder, well, what happened? And in fact, what you can see here, these three questions, these three tasks were about those exception categories. And you can see there's, you know, out of 17 people, instead of getting it totally wrong or giving up, we're getting much higher success rates. Um, over some iterative testing. Now, how, how did we test that? And, and this is how it, where it gets a little meta. <laughs> um, we used a survey to test it. So um, this, we used an online task survey. We couldn't use Loop 11. We didn't have access to user Zoom or anything like that. Um, and so we had to, we didn't have any way, and in fact, we couldn't have dealt with um, tracking the results uh, in anything that caught the users, the participants' click paths, because I'll explain in a minute. So what I did was use this uh, model from uh, Albert Tullis and Tedesco's Beyond the Usability Lab study, where they actually use a survey as a usability test task model. And I, I talked to Tom Tallis at the, uh, at the UXPA event in Seattle uh, about this um, because the advantage too is that people on mobile phones can use the survey as well. Now I had to do some, uh, some tweaking. So I pilot tested this on moderated approach with a kind of semi-moderated approach. So what we did was have people sit down at a computer. I had a research assistant at a university. That people sat down at the computer and um, we turned on the recording and put them in front of the survey and then the moderator walked to the other side of the table so that they weren't involved in the rest of it so that we could tune the way that this survey is showing the task and the instructions in particular. So what we ended up with was a survey that says this, you know, because you're clicking on a link in a, on, a, on a site that takes you to this, take five minutes to help us improve our site. And one of the really important things about doing these kind of online task surveys or usability surveys is to say right up front, it's not an opinion survey. 
right? Because what we find, um, I've run a lot of tree jacks and a lot of online studies over the last 10 years, and sometimes in the comments at the end of a tree jack or any kind of online study, they'll say, it didn't, where were the questions that asked me about how I feel? Right? And we're going, well, you know, that's actually not what's important to us. <laughs> we're trying to find out whether you can actually do what you need to do. So I, I do actually add that in. It's not an opinion study. Um, you know, and be quick. You only have five minutes and you imagine yourself in this scenario. So these we tuned. And then the tricky part, and this is where survey where again comes in so useful for uh, usability testing and those kinds of uh, performance tests. Here, the task was you're planning a trip to see Canada this summer, flying from your home in country. And what it was doing is it's filling in, I set it up in, this, in Survey Gizmo, or like I said, it could be in anything, uh, to sh to, with a variable here that filled it in with the name of your own country that you're in at the moment. Right, so you may not be a citizen, but you're in that country, um, or maybe you're next door to that country and using the IP address is showing up for that country, but whatever. It'll say, so flying from your home in the United Kingdom with your passport from that country without applying, find out what kind of official paperwork, if any, you'll need to get before you come. Now, this isn't an easy task, right? Um, and so we've, we've told people that they can come back and check these instructions. And we did see people doing that during our, uh, our pilot testing. And we also um, provided a link to the site where they were going to find this out uh, in a new tab. So when they clicked on this, it opened in a new tab. And we could see in our, in our uh, pilot testing and in that first round of testing that we were doing, we could see how people were doing that. And then in contrast to the way it's set up in the Beyond the Usability Lab book, we did not provide the answers below because they were very leading to see those answers. So what we did was we just found, we provided three options. One said, I found the answer. One said, I didn't find the answer in five minutes because we didn't want them to spend longer than that. And the other one says, I, give up. I don't think I can find the answer. Um, and then after they click one of those, then they'll see the actual answers that we want them to choose from. Okay, so the, you can see this is a fairly complex setup and it was actually even more complex than that because it only showed that question that you just saw, that task, if you were outside of Canada, right? So if you were outside of Canada, you saw that country specific task, else if you were in Canada, you were randomly assigned to one of three exception tasks. And then they, everybody flowed to the same answer page. So this was a bit tricky to set up, but this is an online study. We're going to get hundreds and hundreds of participants, and we did. Um, and so you have to put the work in and, and use the logic that's one of the things I love about these tools is you can use them in a really simple way or you can use them in a really fancy advanced way. I tend to be a, a real challenge for their support people. <laughs> so um, anyway, you can you can set up the randomizing and who who randomizes and things like that. So um, now this study is, I'm going to provide you with a set of links at the end and you can try out this study yourself if you want. Um, but I wanted to show you that sort of levels of prototyping with Surveyware and then running a usability uh, test with Surveyware. And I will say one thing and that is um, we had about, uh, you know, by the time I selected that one task, we had about uh, 400 people. Um, a lot of people clicked on the link on the website saw that it wasn't an opinion survey and just left, right? They were kind of like, oh my God, look at these instructions and that's okay, right? If they were blown away by the instructions that said this is going to take five minutes, fine, right? We, you know, that's okay. So we still ended up with 400 people and you can see that when you run one of these kind of studies, it's really important to take a look at your data first. We had already hypothesized that the people who were going to answer, I found the answer really quickly, um, would not be of use to us. They're just, you know, goofing around, right? Um, as I call it, <laughs> well, I call it all sorts of things, but there's always some in an online study. And sometimes there's a lot. 
Um, even when you use a panel, there's a lot of people who are goofing around and or just not serious or just looking. Right, so maybe these are just the looky loos. Um, so we remove these people from our analysis, and we and anybody who took longer than five minutes as well. But you can also see that you know there's the people who are giving up. You know, so you you can start to see the the variability here um, in terms of people giving up. If they're going to persevere for three to five minutes, they're less likely to give up. Um, those kind of things. So this is the only group that we analyzed and we had to analyze, there was about, I believe there were 88 countries uh, the participants were from. So you can see uh, we didn't want to follow all those. I each of those 88 countries has a different answer to whether or not they need a visa. Um, well, they're kind of grouped, but, but still, uh, we just wanted to know, did they get the right answer or not? Uh, because if they get to the plane to take off and they don't have the right answer, <laughs> they're not getting on the plane. So uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's an example, like I said, of one of these meta things, prototyping with a survey and then using a survey itself uh, to, to uh, find out how well it's performing. And we'll be testing this again on the, on the website once these changes have gone live. Okay. So let's look at some more surveyware uh, prototyping examples. I showed you one question. Um, you can also, using that kind of detailed logic, you can prototype and test an online application form process. Um, and I work mostly with the government these days, and so some of their application processes are brutally long and difficult. Um, and in this example I'm going to show, we were prototyping kind of a sprint or two ahead of the rest of the team, of the, of the, the coders and the developing team. So, um, for example, we made a very, this had about 30 pages that, I, you know, that it's not that everybody saw 30 pages, it's that the logic passed you through depending on your answers. And one of the amazing things about uh, the survey tools too, as they've developed, is that, um, here, this was a participant in December, and what they were seeing, they were seeing the date in kind of a standard format and putting in their passport number. And in fact, a lot of people were having trouble with where was their passport number. There's a lot of passport numbers on. And so what we did is by January, we actually had added a picture into the survey. Um, and we're prototyping, we're building this survey together as a team. In, in meetings, so so the whole the whole application process is being built together as a team, and then we're having we're running participants every couple of weeks remotely with everybody watching um, and uh, building it up. And you can see that we're 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 getting you know the day and the month and the year are closely associated. The picture is showing you where to find things. Um, so, so you can really do some pretty fancy things with survey tools to do prototyping. Um, and they, uh, so that was an application process, which is, you know, I suppose we could have used uh, an actual online form process, but we, we needed uh, a little more than it had to offer. I looked at it and it wasn't going to do what we needed to do. Okay. So the, if you can prototype an application form, then you can also prototype a wizard, right? So um, again, working in sprints, you've got to be able to really test quickly and change quick, change your prototype quickly and change your design. You've got people on phones using it, um, people on, on uh, desktop computers. We do most of our testing remotely uh, for in Canada because Canada's like the US, it's a very big country. <laughs> so there's no point in inviting people just from Ottawa when there's people all over the country and there's multiple languages to deal with here. Uh, we always test in French as well. So here we were dealing with uh, some pretty complex tax rules. And uh, we were, our initial testing uh, discovery kind of mode showed that people were having trouble working their way through this table of what mattered to them, right? And where, whether they should or should not register. So we built a wizard again in Survey Gizmo. 
um, and the team was building this wizard together. Really easy, no coding skills required, um, and built this wizard and um, walks you through, there's about eight steps here. <laughs> I'm not going to show you the whole wizard, it is in one of the links that I'm going to provide. And again, just took, in, went into Survey Gizmo, took that piece of code, plopped it onto a page and and on one page in, in GitHub and you've got an entire working wizard and you can make the changes in your survey tool to the wizard to tune it in, in any way that you need and then you don't have to touch your code again, you, the, the, the prototype page again. It's all just changing via Survey Gizmo. And you can, from Survey Gizmo, you can also look at the data to see what people are answering. Um, so it provides a, a team without, who doesn't have access to the code a really quick and easy way. Uh, so not just for prototyping. So we were able to test this um, and iteratively again, um, and uh, we, could, we could send people to this page via usertesting.com as well, um, and through remote sessions and in-person mobile testing. So really handy way to quickly mock up and get wizards working and iteratively design them. Okay, here's an older example. Um, and this is one where we had to test, uh, we had to do some validation research um, with a team who were trying to improve the success at choosing facets for top tasks. So this particular um, site is called BizPal and in Canada it's used to figure out what kind of permits and licenses you need for a specific type of business activity. And what we were seeing is that for some of the really top tasks like starting a restaurant, um, people were, didn't seem to know which facets to choose. I'm calling these facets because they're, you know, they're, you check them and they have numbers and things. Um, so what we did was, I was trying to think of a way to do this online. Um, to, to How would I test this? in a quantitative way, you know, because I, I, it's fairly complex. It would take a long time to do this in person. Uh, so I made a survey <laughs> and um, what I did, and it was tricky though, because each of these has to be a question, right? And then I had to, 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 to kind of put it all together. So the task is up here. Um, we, we showed people the task, it said select the activities that would display the right set of per permits and licenses if you wanted to open a restaurant with a bar. And these were the facets at the time. And we also had a study with the new proposed set of facets. So we were really uh, tr tr trying out all sorts of solutions. And what we had to do though, the bit of jiggery pokery with the survey was was oh I couldn't I had to make because these sets of facets have headings I had to make each of those groups into a question and then uh, do some Excel wizardry at the end uh, to to put together the answers but we did end up with a, a very different set of facets that were uh, people met, help people be much more successful at at choosing and their top tasks. So, so that's another one where I was running an online study um, and to to get quantitative data across a lot of conditions. Uh, so that really helps. We just posted a link on the site. All right, here's another research goal, and that is recruiting participants for your next sprints. Um, when you need sign of specialist participants. Right? So this particular study uh, was redesigning the, uh, the information architecture and the navigation and menus for the Library and Archives site of Canada. Um, and Library and Archives has a lot of academic researchers using it. It has um, professional researchers, it has genealogists, um, and then there's just the general public. So we, we wanted to make sure, so this wasn't a case where I could go out to a recruiting agency and say, find me these kinds of people, like <laughs> that just didn't make sense, right? Those people were already on the site, I needed to recruit them from the site. So what we did is our first TreeJack study had a recruit tacked on to the end of the study. 
So if you participated in the TREEJAC study that was posted online, um, at the end of it, it showed you a recruiter and we then used those participants in our live usability sessions and the prototype that we were building while this was going on. So this, these TREEJAC studies are going on and we're building a prototype in the background with the input from them and then we use that in some moderated sessions to really get the qualitative uh, input. Um, so we were able to get some fantastic participants this way, um, all from those sets of people that we know we needed because they're more likely to participate in this kind of uh, session. Lisa, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Would you mind just elaborating a little bit about the tree jack study for people who aren't aware of what this is? Uh, of what a tree jack is? Yes. Okay, sure. Sure. A tree jack, actually, I think I might have a tree jack on the next page. Uh, no, I don't. No. Okay. Well, it, optimal, tree jack is an optimal workshop tool for, um, and I'm going to provide a link that you can try it out. Um, for testing an information architecture or a navigation architecture. And the tool allows you to set up tasks and the tree that people are going to navigate. And so in this case, we had the existing architecture, the existing tree, then we had a proposed revised tree, and then after we got the input back from those, we made another tree. So there were three tree jack studies during this process. So three studies like this. And um, people click in, use, do tasks, and perform, uh, put in their answers onto it. And then at the end of that study, we redirected them to a, a recruiter. Right. And that's important ethically from my point of view that I didn't ask, I didn't do the recruiting actually in the tree jack because I could have. There are, you can ask questions at the end of a tree jack um, study, but I did, I did that into a separate study so that there's no contamination of people's identifying information with their actual uh, data about their, their study. So, um, this this kind of method is is uh, very effective, and there is a, a demo of a tree jack in the in the links that I'm going to provide at the end of this this thing. So anyway, that's how to do it is to add a recruiter, and then we usually added a question at the end. So at the end of the tree jack, it says thanks for taking the time to help. After you click continue, you'll be offered a chance to qualify for a detailed 50 minute online usability session sometime in the next year. If you're selected you'll receive a $50 Amazon gift certificate as a thank you for your time after your session. We do offer an incentive. Uh, I gave them my info and then they got passed on to the recruiter. Okay, so these tree jack, uh, so, so like I said, we ended up with a lot of specialist recruits in our study that we could then run in the live usability sessions at the end on the prototype to test because TreeJack's great for testing a tree, but in this case, we actually had mega menus and, uh, you know, they work on hover. Uh, so, and there could have been people, you know, using it from tablets and things. So we really wanted to make sure that the working prototype, we got some testing in there too. So great way to recruit. You can add an Ethneo on to the end of a study too, if, you, if you're an Ethneo recruiting user. Okay, all right, here's a really wacky one. Um, and that is, I just talked about tree jack and how you set up a tree in tree jack. One of the, if you've ever phoned for help uh, and you've heard press one, press two, um, that's a tree as well. And I was hired to uh, help a team evaluate the new, the design of their new interactive voice response system because many people still call for help um, and that they had a design, a potential new design that they wanted to test and when they initially hired me they said okay so we'll, we've got our design, we will record it in the recording studio and then you can test it and I said no, 
<laughs> like there's no way that's going to work, right? Because I'm going to come back and say, you need to change this, 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 and this, and you're not going to want to change it because you'll have already blown your recording studio budget, right? So this just didn't, and I wasn't happy with their design uh, because they had already told me, they had provided me with data that said this many people, like a huge percentage, 60, 80, 80% 80 maybe, look at the website first and then call. And the voice response system that they were um, designed, that they were showing me, had absolutely no relation at all to the website topics. Right, so if you'd used a, a menu in, on the website and their website was pretty task oriented, then you hit the phone menus, they were totally different. So I wanted to compare two, right? So it's like, oh no, how am I gonna do this? Now I had already imagined that I would use a sort of Wizard of Oz kind of idea. And if you're not familiar with that idea, it's that uh, a Wizard of Oz study is when there's a person um, pretending to be the system. So in this case, I was going to have an actor or, you know, a, a collaborator pretend to be the voice response system and say, press one for this, press two for this. And then they gave me the script. And it was 40 pages long. And I went, oh my gosh, like I can't sit there and have my collaborator go flip, 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 flip through 40 pages based on what the person was selecting, right? So I was like, oh, damn, <laughs> I should have thought of this before I took this contract. But um, then uh, I was out running, and this is a very good thing to do, to have ideas when you get faced with a solution like this. Um, and I suddenly thought of TreeJack, because these telephone scripts are trees. And so what we did was, I thought, I'm going to put it into TreeJack. And the collaborator, my actor, the voice, can click and read the TreeJack as if he's the phone, phone system. Um, and instead of having to flip through this long script and trying to find his way, TreeJack will help us out. Um, so there was some coding magic involved there in terms of turning the script into an Excel tree. Because for TreeJack, you can, you can dump the tree into TreeJack via Excel. Um, so someone, uh, actually my, my sweet husband, who happens to be a technical whiz, so handy, um, was able to run a Ruby script against the, the, the Word, 40 page Word script, two of them by now, because I'm gonna compare two designs and transform that script into an Excel tree and dump that into TreeJack. Now that did necessitate a few support calls to the Optimal Workshop team in New Zealand because like I blew them away with like a 40 page script. The tree was like the longest they'd ever seen and they kind of, you know, the support guys typing back to me, um, you know, this is for testing website menus. <laughs> like, yeah, I know, but I need it to do this. And uh, so anyway, we, we worked it out and uh, they, they have terrific support and they've always been very, very helpful to me. Uh, so they worked it out and we ended up running the study. So I was the facilitator um, and I read the task to the participant and then the person, my Wizard of Oz person, read the tree jack out and clicked in the responses. So he would say, for English, press one. Choose one of these menu options. For application status, change of address, lost or stolen documents, press one. And then there's the participant. Now they can't see the screen. They are connected to the online meeting only through their phone, right? So they would say, I'll press two. So instead of, you know, so they had to sort of do a bit of pretending themselves and say, and press the two button instead of pressing two. Uh, but uh, it worked really well. And the tree jack was uh, great. And we actually ended up using that tree jack to have the team at the department um, 
test test their tree out and and review the design of their tree because they could see and interact with it so much better than a script right so there was a really terrific bonus here and that is that the actor picked up on behavioral cues so that's one of the beauties of using a wizard of oz method um, and that is that when the participant selected the you know press star to play again he slowed down his speech and this was particularly important because a lot of these people didn't have English as a first language or French as a first language um, and he also emphasized particular words now I have a video of this but I, I can't play videos on here but it's really quite amazing um, because he wasn't even aware that he was doing it I was I picked it up right away but he did, he he was doing this because he's a human being um, and it's built into his brain that if someone says, I didn't get, you know, I, I not get that, I didn't get that, then he slowed it down. Uh, so it was just a fantastic side benefit of doing it this way. Now, so at the end, we, uh, we chose the script that, uh, because it had a higher success rate, the script that matched their menus in their website. And we recommended that they script in their emphasis. So for example, there was um, one of those said, uh, for the permanent resident program, press two, for the temporary resident program, press three. So we actually, in the script, put a note to the to the actor who was going to read the script and said emphasize the word permanent emphasize the word temporary right um, and then we also recommended that they change the output speed of the speech of the system if the person said press i want to hear the menus again and those that's actually built into interactive voice response systems who knew i found that quite amazing Okay, I have a final one that I'm going to whip through because this one is almost worth a whole nother talk and I'm getting really close to the end of the time. Actually, yeah, okay. So here the research goal was to validate an A-B design alternative without any A-B testing. We didn't have any way to do A-B testing on this website. Um, and we weren't kind of ready to publicly A-B test that way anyway. Uh, because there was a lot of design work to do. So we had this process where we developed design ideas and these were very oriented to the visual design. And so we ran about 75 eye tracking participants on this Eyes Decide system over 16 really small iterative studies. Then we wanted to measure the baseline and then we wanted to validate that performance in an online study. So we've got a sort of cycle going on here of iterating and validating. So we used a kind of, I call it gorilla eyes, <laughs> and that is we ran eyes decide sessions um, with a facilitator in cafes and lounges and uh, student, student uh, centers. Now eyes decide is a way to do eye tracking from a laptop using the laptop camera. So no fancy eye tracker involved, no equipment to set up. You just pop your laptop onto the table in the Starbucks and invite the person next to you to participate and pay them five or 10 bucks at the end of the session. It only takes a few minutes. Um, we had to kind of work out the whole protocol for this. Eyes Decide is designed to do it remotely, to just send the link to people. But I was working with a government team. The government isn't really willing to send something to 100 people and have it only work for about 10, because this was early on in Eyes Decide's process. Um, so we just didn't feel that was there yet. It was during the beta. Uh, but I had student research assistants who could run around all over the city and do this stuff. And, uh, oh, let's just remind me later about this Java thing. Thank you. Um, and uh, so I had those folks running around. We worked out the protocol and we were able to learn a lot. Um, and sometimes we were learning things that 
all of you probably know already. Uh, like, for example, people don't look at pictures much on a web page. So here we were actually looking at this little blue box. There was a link in a blue box attached to a photograph. So it made it into all one box. Now, I have a whole other talk about invisible boxes. Uh, but in this case, it clearly is because we tried different designs. Here the link in the box is at the top. Here's the link in the box is at the bottom. And it should be pretty clear if you know anything about eye tracking and intensity of gaze. Red means people are looking at it. Blue means just a few people looked there. And white means really no one looked there. Uh, so you can see that that approach wasn't working. So the design kept iterating um, until they got to the point where it just looked like a link here, right? So we had run all those studies, we had some initial design proposals, and now we needed qualitative or quantitative data. We needed to run this with a lot of people to really get a good sense that this was an okay way to go. So in Chalkmark, this is another optimal workshop product. Um, Chalkmark shows the task and an image, and people click on the image to answer the task, to solve the task. And it measures their success rate, like did they click on the target that you set up on the image? You can put, put a box on the image to say what that's your target. And how long did it take them? And what, what else? You know, so so you can really see whether people look at it, or, or not, not whether they look at it, whether they get the right answer. Now we had to do two versions of the study. We did an A and a B, because like I said, we were mimicking A and B testing, but we had 11 tasks counterbalanced across the A and B where they saw the control. In study A, they would see the control image, and study B, they would see the new design. Um, now you may be thinking to yourself, what the heck are those? And that wasn't part of my job in this particular series, so <laughs> bear with me on that. Um, but uh, you can see the difference in the designs here. This one was a kind of carousel-y thing, and this one we called the uncarousel. So we ran that chalk mark um, with a panel. Optimal Workshop has panels and we were able to use their panel and we were also able to email out the link to the chalk mark to a bunch of people who we recruited through other studies. Um, so, so we ran that study, we ended up like I said with about 200 people. And at the same time we ran an eye tracking study on Eyes Decide with the identical stimuli and the identical tasks. So in Eyes Decide, they can only do one task. They have about 60 seconds of tracking uh, after they see one task. And we did the same thing. We counterbalanced with half of A and half of B. So A saw the control image first, and then the new image, and B saw the new image, and then the control. And here, you can start to see the difference that we could see between the control and the new in terms of whether they were, what they were looking at. Right, where their gaze was fixated for the longest and what pe more people looked at because you can make a heat map over all of the participants in this study. Right? So that's what these represent is all of the participants over a certain period of time. And then we put it all together to explain the results. So we had our quantitative data from Chalkmark and that is for example, for this task, find out how to keep the PIN code for your new debit card safe. 23% of the participants of the 400 participants, well, only 200 would have done it this way, but anyway, split across the A and B, um, would have seen clicked on this target. And in the new design where it just looks like a link and it's not built into the box of the image, 56% found the target. And then you can look at the eye tracking evidence and you can see why that happened, right? And that is, if you look at this, you can see that the edge of the red that shows long fixations and a lot of people's fixations does not cover the entire link. It's looking at these little buttons and, and you can watch little videos of what people are doing. Whereas here, look at the way the red 
spreads across the entire link. They were looking and reading, and we could look in the videos and do this heat map analysis differently, we could see they were actually reading this link. So that gives us the why of these quantitative results. So we've got a qualitative and a quantitative so that they can understand with the eye tracking and measure with the chalk mark. And if you'd had A-B testing, you could have done A-B testing. Okay, I have one final hack and then I'm going to stop and go to questions. And that is, uh, this isn't a software hack, but I do have online a lovely little hack for a mobile uh, testing camera. And that is, we were using some fancy c cameras and Mr. Tappies and things and never happy with them. You had to have a separate microphone, it was real pain. So I ordered one of these because I looked at it and said, look at, look at this hinge here, maybe I can take this off. And I, in fact, I could flip it over, so I bought one, it was less than $200. I could flip it over, take the weights out of the base, flip it right over and I've got a beautiful mobile usability camera that I can type, uh, connect into the computer. The person puts their phone there, picks up the whole thing, right? Doesn't have to sit on a desk. They pick it up and hold it in their hand. The microphone's built into here. Beautiful hack. And now we're into the questions. I'm going to paste this link into, oh, no, I'm not. I can't. I will in a minute. I'll paste this link into the chat so that you all have the link um, or you or it'll be in the recording because all of most of the things that I've just talked about I'm providing links to them on this uh, on that the page that's connected to there so that you can try them out yourself. Okay all right and I'll flip it over to Jen for the questions. All right awesome thank you so much can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we've got um, a bunch of questions here. For those of you who asked questions during the presentation, like about specific studies, if you don't mind um, adding to your question or, or retyping your question with a little bit more detail, since we're now, you know, talking about studies that Lisa was talking about just a bit ago, I think that would be helpful. All right, so um, let's see. How long after the TreeJack study did you conduct the live online usability sessions? Um, in this case, oh, a week. <laughs> it was brutal. Um, you know, a lot of things these days are are done agile. A lot of our work is is agile. So we we were we were building parts of it while the, uh, we were building the prototype while the tree jack was going on. And so we just had to kind of move things around based on the tree jack results. Uh, so yeah, we did that within a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see, in your online studies, um, let's see, all right, I'm just gonna read this one out. It's a little bit long. Yeah. So I assume in your online studies, you didn't work with truly random samples, but with convenient samples. So likely there were self-selection effects. Do you think these self-selection effects actually mattered for your specific studies? Or maybe for some reason, did any self-selection effects not matter that much for some studies? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely self-selection effects. You're right. Uh, because you post a link on a site, a lot of people aren't, aren't, gonna, aren't gonna click on it. Um, and on government sites, a few more people do because they, they really want to improve government web pages. There's more motivation. Um, I don't think, I didn't think the self-selection mattered in these cases um, because they were self-selecting on the basis of being willing to do a task, um, which is, you know, the way it is. Um, they were self-selecting on the basis of um, having time, uh, being interested. There was, th there's a lot of reasons to select in and really I didn't think it mattered because all I cared about was can the people who participate figure out whether, can they get the right answer or not? So I hope that helps. I, I, I think too the other thing about self-selection versus a random sample, one of the things that 
uh, I mentioned this about the library and archives, is I don't, I don't want a random sample of Canadians uh, for a library and archives Canada site test because a random sample of Canadians don't use the library and archives site. So I'm recruiting on the site to get the people who use the site. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And my response to that is always, you know, what when we're when we're looking for usability issues, user experience um, issues. You know, not having a random sample is okay. The random samples are are more important when we're looking at polling of the population, right? Mm -hmm. Because here we're, we're looking for issues, and then we can fix those issues. So it's actually less important in a lot of the research that we're doing. Of course, if it was a survey and you wanted to make um, claims about the population, then you know, in those cases, the random sample is more important. Yeah, and that's a good point, Jen, because the, the other thing, too, is that even if there is self-selection, um, if I'm going, I'm often doing a test retest, right? So I'm doing a test against the baseline, and then I'm retesting, so like that country one that I was talking about. So it doesn't matter to me, like, the people who self-selected in or out are going to, over the big scale, self-select in and route it the next time too, right? If yeah. I've got enough people. So that's that's where I'm after. So Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have some questions around the eye tracking. And this of course, <laughs> you know, my experience with eye tracking too, I was very interested in the in the um, the tool that you used. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from the audience. Were all of those sessions, the eye tracking sessions in person or were there any um, remote sessions? Um, so we ran the about a hundred of them in person, um, and we found so with Eyes Decide there is a whoops I'll just pull it up um, there is a uh, um, kind of fair bit of requirements about how much light there is in the room, where the person's sitting, are they wearing glasses or not, um, those kind of things. And okay. we did we Sorry. did try... You cut yeah. out a bit. So you were talking about um, the lighting in the room, and then what? Yeah. Uh, there's a, requirements about the lighting in the room. They can't be wearing glasses. Um, they have to, you know, um, have the computer set at the right distance and angle for them. Now some of those things are managed I, in my in my links page here I'm just going to paste this links into the chat panel so everybody can see it and get the links just a second. Uh, here we go. Okay so you all can click on that link. Um, there's a I, I put a video demonstration of the participant experience for a nice to side session. So if you really want to kind of get the feel of what it what it's like, um, I, I you can watch the video and sort of see how that goes. Um, but yeah, we ran about a, a hundred people in person. We did try and run some remotely. Um, and what we did was build a panel from the per pe from the people that we'd run in person. So after we ran them in person, we said, would you like to participate remotely? Um, and we, and if they said yes, we took their name and info and their email address, and then we could email them links. But I have to say that that uh, we had a a much higher failure rate on those uh, people not able to do it very well, um, which is fine. Like if you've got buckets of I, uh, if you've got a lot of money in your budget um, and you can and uh, you know you can afford to send the links out to hundreds of people you'll get enough of a sample by doing it remotely right so it is designed to run remotely and they're they've been working really hard to improve it for running remotely um, but I just it just wasn't ready at the time how did you feel about the quality of that data? Because, you know, one of my critiques with a lot of the eye trackers out there and the different eye tracking solution is the quality. 
of the or I, there's a right. couple things about quality. One is just data capture, period. But the second is the specificity of the eye tracking. You know, like if you wanted to the screen that you have up now, if we wanted to do eye tracking mm -hmm. on the screen, you know, do you recommend that tool for something like this? Can you see, you know, line by line, or is it more general? You know, people are looking this area versus this area. Um, no, you can actually see what words they're reading, right? Wow. So you can you can actually see. Um, I, I'd have to pull up a different image, but um, I think it might even be in this video. But you can actually get down to the granularity of seeing what what words they're reading. Um, wow. And one thing that's nice about it too is in Eyes Decide, um, it shows you. It kind of it kind of scores the participants' accuracy. Um, so uh, you can select in, so say you had 20 people run a study, you can select in and say, I want a heat map of all the people with an accuracy score of over 80 mm -hmm. and just use those ones. Right. So no, no. It, I, I've 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 used uh, the other kind of you know in in academic research. I've used the uh, the real you know fifty thousand dollar eye trackers as yeah. well. And I uh, know I could I could get up to that level in the right situations with this. Wow, I definitely have to check it out because I'm yeah. I'm certainly using the more expensive eye tracker. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you, can't, you know you need the equipment, so you can't do the remote sessions so this is right. this seems like a great alternative I'll have to check it out right right yeah do it's it's really amazing for that cool. kind of thing all right let's see if we can get a couple more questions in um, what would be a good alternative to the mobile testing hack and do you think the hack itself affected the experience since it's no longer natural usage so do you do they mean the camera for the mobile testing is that what they mean I believe yeah I think this is what it was about Okay, um, do I think that being in person and doing their testing affects the experience? Yes, because there's experiment effects. Um, that's why I, my other link there is about <laughs> turning on the camera. Um, but um, no, in my experience, once people start interacting with their phone and it's in their hand and they're doing a task, um, they're doing things so it looks it looks like this um, once they're once it's in their hand and they're working away and typing and selecting things no I, d I don't find it. it and they don't have to wear a headset or anything else it's and this actually this looks like it's in their way but it's not really because they just tilt it out of the way so uh, we've done tons of mobile participants using this method and uh, and you you know in terms of the usability of this page t task success rates time on task whether they can touch the targets because we can see whether they fail to touch a target um, no it's it's great yeah, uh, yeah we have very similar tools as well and, and I, I would agree you know it's, mm -hmm. it's slightly different from the natural experience but it's not the equipment is not really getting in the way and people forget that it's even on this little you know device or what we call a sled yeah and I, yeah and i think it's way more important that they use their own phone in this model yeah. right? right like that's the key to me is that they're using their own phone with all its bizarreties and you know the the text messages we always have to tell people oh could you turn those off <laughs> right because our messages or notifications are popping up no I, I I think it's way more useful to have them use their own phone on a sled like this than to have them use your phone you know a phone you provide that's yeah. where it gets into wacky stuff wonderful cool um, can you share maybe the link this looks like it's on your LinkedIn but can you throw that in the chat window as well somebody is asking for that and I, there's probably other really useful things here I guess um, you know the link of this page the link of this the link of this article yep okay it's actually it's actually on it's actually on the link that I sent earlier so this okay. this Wonderful. link it's right here flip for this mobile usability camera hack Perfect. And this this link, um, for those of you who didn't see it in your little window there, in yep. the chat, um, if you click on chat, you'll see a link to that. And we'll make sure, again, this is being recorded, so we will upload this to our website so you'll have all of this information there as well. Right. 
All right. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Lisa. This was yeah. really awesome. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. And I know others did as well. We had some really great questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us today and for this wonderful presentation. Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity. Fantastic. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.